most pioneers of early film, the Lumiere's brothers were equal part showman, entrepreneur, and inventor. Film was decades away from merging with theater. Actors, narrative, didn't make their way in for many, many years. The subject of film at its onset, I think, mimics a lot of what gets shared on YouTube today. Happenings, occurrences. Not false realities, but amazing events. A little bit of video trickery, a little bit of subterfuge. This is the first time anyone ever saw something go in reverse. The first time entropy didn't work. Well, what is entropy? Entropy is a measure of the irreversibilities in a thermodynamic process. Yeah. Um, the first law of thermodynamics you guys have heard before. Matter, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be turned into the other and back again. It's always conserved, never goes away. The second law says that every time you do change something, every time something goes through a process, that there is something lost. It's its ability to do work. And to be honest, I don't really understand it either. But we put values on it in engineering. It's S, and you can look it up. You can determine how much entropy is going to be, is going to exist, or how much losses will occur during a thermodynamic event. It's known. It's repeated. It can be measured, understood only through figures and repeatability as a mechanism. But the better way to think about entropy is it's the only phenomena phenomenon phenomena that agrees with what we perceive as the arrow of time that time seems to go in a direction that we kind of all agree that the past is in one direction the future is in, is in the other and we're in the present um, in many ways, it mimics that, that bar across the bottom of your video. The past is to the left, the future is to the right, and we're right on that cursor level. In a lot of physics, as far as I understand, you can reverse time and the results all work out. Most of physics doesn't care which direction time goes. But this thing called entropy is the only one that has uh, an arrow. Um, often entropy gets the synonym of decay. That's what we're seeing here in Sam Tyler Wood's piece. Again, a little bit of video subterfuge. Somehow, this rabbit carcass is definitely in time lapse. That might take weeks for all of that to happen that we're seeing in a few minutes. And somehow that peach stays undisturbed. There's some fantastic reference to still life painting. 
still life painting is some kind of trickery with colored mud to make you believe that there's actually grapes sitting on the table. Compositing is just another form of that, perhaps. The best way to think about entropy is that we tend to notice that things go from ordered states to disordered states when left alone. Robert Smithson often used the concept of entropy as the main subject of his work. Arguably, the material he was working with was entropy. He had a great analogy for understanding entropy. It's the analogy of the sandbox. You should imagine a sandbox, a square sandbox, let's say eight feet by eight feet, Half of the sandbox is filled with black sand. The other half is filled with white sand. And a perfect ordered split of black and white sand. And then Smithson asks a child to go walk in a clockwise direction around the sandbox, through the sandbox inside the sandbox and as the kid is walking around and around he's kicking up sand and the sand over time is getting more and more mixed together turning into a bland tepid gray state the more he walks the more it mixes smithson then tells the kid to stop and start walking in the reverse direction in the counterclockwise direction we all know what's going to happen. It's just going to keep mixing more. The reversal of the performance, the direction of the movement of the child does not reverse the effects of entropy. That the ordered state of the black and white sand just gets more and more mixed together towards gray. In one of Smithson's seminal works, Partially Buried Woodshed, he asked uh, an excavator to dig up big piles of sand and drop them on the side of an old woodshed on the campus of Kent State University. And he told the excavator to keep doing it, load more, load more, load more. He kept doing it until the weight of the sand was enough to break the main central beam of the woodshed. And at that moment, he told the excavator to stop because the artwork had been realized. The artwork is not this photo. And to be honest, I don't know if this is actually the real photo of the event. The artwork was, to Smithson, the entropic moment, or rather, the entropic threshold that split in time, the moment where you couldn't go back, that you couldn't remove dirt and have the woodshed go back together again. Think of it as the straw on the camel's back. But think more of it as an artwork that is a concept, uh, a fleeting moment, uh, a moment of transition, a performance. This is an apparatus. When I use the word apparatus, I use it very loosely as something contrived by an artist, 
something set up, something to make something happen. Remember that word play. Think about the way you can set up an apparatus and the way that you make it play, the way that it's played, the way it plays. Archangelo Sassolino has a different sensibility than Smithson. Or Smithson took artwork out of the gallery, removed its commodity, its place within the white cube. Sassolino, on the other hand, is contriving the event inside the gallery, creating an apparatus that can recreate that event over and over again. It seems like a nod to Smithson's Parsi buried woodshed, breaking a big wooden beam. Sassolino might be doing the same thing, but he's bringing uh, a somewhat unpredictable moment. He's, uh, he likes to break things, and he likes to break things in a very sensational fashion, a lot of power, and a lot of unpredictability. Sometimes the thing that he breaks is the gallery itself. It's not really known when the event will happen. The people who sit in the gallery tend to detest <laughs> Sassolino's work. The bottle, I got to see myself uh, on a show in Italy, it seemed harmless enough. The, the sitter that's beside this piece is in absolute trepidation, anxiety to the highest level, because at any moment that bottle is going to blast and blow apart, and it happens sometimes. And often it doesn't, but all day long, the tension is there. Some of you may know Jermaine Co. She was the artist in residence at AVA for a couple of years. Um, many of her works have a similar sensibility of bringing a phenomenon into the gallery. And she does so by sensors. The sensor sits outside the gallery measuring something that enacts the performance of something inside the gallery. Some of them are complicated. Some of them can be easily done with Arduinos. Some of them could probably be easily done by asking chat GPT how to do it with an Arduino. Um, this piece mimics what the sunlight is doing outside. So if it's dark, the gallery gets dark. 
This piece has a sensor somewhere in the English Bay and measures the tide level. And what it does is it makes the stanchions go up and down relative to the tides. Similar gesture from David Bowen measures not just one point of the water level, but several points. Those points mapped out in a grid. I'm trying to count it, looks like maybe a 10 by 10 grid. And each one of those points is then lifted up and down relative to the measured distance. In effect, David Bowen is transposing a wave into the gallery. performance of this floating grid is uncanny. The idea that it seems to trigger something strange. It's almost too good. It feels like a wave. It does such a good job of transposing the motion of something natural, even though it's very clearly not natural phenomena. We see the mechanism, we see the trick. The subterfuge is before us, yet our perception tells us that something else might be going on. To describe movement is difficult. It is to confront that thrill on the deepest level of filmic enterprise. To recognize the privileged character of the medium as being in itself the promise of an incomparable, an unhoped for, grasp upon the nature of causality.
Arthur Ganson. She sets up a similar relationship with a very mechanical machine playing with some other appendage. You can watch more of his videos, more of his pieces. He does the video documentation always the same way, where it's a slow reveal of the whole thing. I recommend watching the Wishbone. Um, this piece, I appreciate it as a painting. It might be a hard stretch. Um, but it's these types of folds that would be studied by apprentice painters in the early modern period. Ultimately, I'd say this apparatus, this mechanical contrivance, is to reference that style of tonal study over and over again, watching this inanimate thing animate and show its beautiful folds and most paintable forms. I like building machines, but to be honest, I'd rather paint that than build that machine. And I'll admit, I'm showing you too many machines. You're not going to build a machine. The apparatus that you set up shouldn't be this complex contrivance. But the play, the way that he uses the fabric and the fan as a medium to affect causality, to affect change, to create plurality, I think is in its simplest form is playful. Kevin Cooley's We Can Break Through. The video loops, or rather repeats. We'll fade to black, come back on, fans are plugged back in, and the duel starts.
another dual fan apparatus contraments from John Wood and Paul Harrison. Basically making a paper stand up on its own. A similar piece was created by a UBC student, not in 310, but in a sculpture class, 361, I believe. Um, this piece is better than John Wood and Paul Harrison's, and arguably better than Kevin Cooley's. The page that she is floating between the fans, bouncing back and forth, um, is a moment within the novel where um, the main character makes a kind of a climactic shift from girlhood to womanhood. Um, Curry's kind of right in the middle of the book. Um, the way that the artist is using the physicality of the book and the playfulness of the pages, this in-between state, the impossibleness of being a girl one day and a woman the next, but told through narrative, not with narrative, but with the materiality of the book. It's very well done. I think it's a fantastic piece. This is another piece by John Wood and Paul Harrison. I'll show you a um, little Tate mini documentary on their practice after this. But I like this work a lot. It's simple, it's playful, destructive, and it's got this um, almost excessive preoccupation with geometry. I don't know for sure, but I know for sure that that stack of paper was measured out. 11 and a half times what equals one kilometer. And they're just blasting it out as fast as they can with that sander. It looks unbelievably satisfying. I wish I had the whole video. Before uh, you go into the next four minutes watching many small vignette works of John Wood and Paul Harrison's practice. Um, project number two is not to be taken as a performance piece. Yes, your body might be present. Your body might be part of the apparatus, part of the contrivance of making change take place. But it's not a performance project and this isn't a performance class. While well, looking at John Wood and Paul Harrison, I want you to examine the way that they set up the shot. We met at our college in the late 80s and then we just started to talk about things we could possibly do together. And this began with a series of really quite awful live performances. It felt very straightforward and very easy to work together. And from that moment on, we then spent a couple of years messing around with a camera and filming things, not really knowing what we were doing, but forming a vocabulary. A lot of it is still in place today. You know, we still follow a lot of the kind of structure or the rules or the logic that we kind of set up in those two years. One of the things that has sustained it for 24 years is laughter. <laughs> we come in here and we're having a really boring day trying to work technical things out or we're trying to crack the last part of a video and we're trying to put all the parts together and make this kind of thing work. Throughout that, we make each other laugh. <laughs> just makes it kind of funny. You can't lark about on your own. I think as well the idea of a lone artist in the studio has just gone. Every artist collaborates and it's just that we have this one ongoing one that never ends. I think a lot of our work is about how the human figure negotiates the world in a sort of physical sense in terms of architecture, 
but also the objects that we interact with, whether that's driving your car or the pencil that you write with, how those things were made and where they came from, why they're the colour that they are. It's almost like cataloguing all of these things and kind of looking at their function and, and what you can do with them and the other things that you can do with them. Their pieces are as much video, maybe more so video, than they are performance. They work with the video apparatus. The video apparatus is part of the overall apparatus. It's the bodies, the material, the setting, the objects, and the video camera are part of the apparatus. So consider how you might use the video apparatus as part of the setup. Consider how you might use video editing as part of, I guess the way that I like to emphasize, deception, the subterfuge, to, to trick our perception. Film is already doing that. There's already a starting point of film tricking our eyes. Think about how you might do it further. We were just making these things that were very matter of fact and we would talk to people about how they interpreted that because we would get very wide ranging responses. I would say that for years we didn't think about it. We didn't really think about the tone of the work. We began to talk about the feel that we wanted a work to have and really trying to make sure that you're doing something that you haven't done before. Uh, with that said, your apparatus might be camera, you might be taking stills. Uh, the medium is open to you. Uh, this piece by John Baldessari um, is a setup that results in a lot of photos. The impossibility of all those four balls being a perfect square. He just takes photos and throws and photos and throws and photos and throws. And you get an artwork out of it, a collection. A collection of attempts. Returning to David Bowen's telepresent water, it's not dissimilar to Baldessari's gesture. It's a grid in space, they're both red. Clearly a different concepts at work here. But I brought this piece back up because I wanted to say the word uncanny one more time before I show you the last three works. And we will break down the notion of the uncanny valley, which is the very last slide. I won't explain it, I'll just leave it to you. Um, but the uncanny valley, valley the idea of the Uncanny Valley will be very relevant to your project number three. Specifically, the way in which we anthropomorphize robots. Fan. Dryer. Dry. Knife. Well...